Hi, and thanks for joining us on Ask Troy Live. Thanks to Eric from Garden Fork for sharing such great tips on caring for your lawn. I'm Jack, joined by Dustin and Tim. The three of us are lawnmower experts from Troy Build, and we are here to answer all your questions about mower maintenance and troubleshooting. So many decide to go outside and use their mower without performing any preseason maintenance. Today, we'll be walking through how to change your mower blade, air cleaner, engine oil, spark plug, and more, along with some important spring tasks. So drop your questions in the chat, and we'll be answering them as we go. Our colleague, Mary Beth, and the Troy Bill team are behind the scenes to share your questions with us and help us get the details right. So, let's get started. We're gonna start in with mower blades. Tim, why don't we go ahead and start with the walk and walk them through what they need to know about their mower blades. Oh yeah, absolutely, Jack. Um, if you wanna hand me a pair of gloves there and that blade, we'll, get, we'll go ahead and talk about this. Absolutely, here you go, sir. Thank you, sir. <clears throat> Very important when handling mower blades that you put on all, all appropriate equipment, prevent yourself from not only injuring yourself, but uh, having a chance of damaging things. So, mower blades is, is, is in a nutshell, um, are very important for the quality of your cut. So the mower blade, um, our mower blades in general um, are very uh, sturdy and uh, it's very important that you keep them sharp you use the appropriate mower blade and you change them regularly for a season. So we take a look at this walk behind mower for instance. Um, I will hand this mower blade back to Jack. Uh, we'll go ahead and have Dustin, um, our assistant, lift up the mower and we'll show you guys uh, what you're actually looking for. So let's so, talk about a couple things first yeah, before we get into it. Absolutely. That. So mower blades from the OEM are blades that are tested and refined to make sure that everything is good for you, the consumer. So it's really, really important that you use the right blade. Another thing is, obviously every season they should be sharpened whether they need to be or not. Why? Just like we talked earlier, they need to be sharp to keep consistent cut in the grass. What's extremely important is keeping this blade edge across, even and at the angle that it's at. Now, what I just handed Tim was a kit that allows you to easily take the blade off the mower. It mounts to the side of the deck, and then he's going to go ahead and show you how that functions and works with the unit that's on there already. Absolutely. Thanks, Jack. So this tool actually is going to mount to the side of the mower deck, and if you can see underneath of the deck of the mower, and it actually en it encapsulates the blade and allows it to hold its position, so you can actually remove the blade, the blade bolt with ease. Using a wrench, usually uh, our, using a wrench uh, and our blade lock tool, which you can notice over here to the side, actually locks into the, the deck itself. Removing this center bolt using a socket wrench. Now, th kind of the thing to keep in mind is that you, as you use your mower, this blade bolt may become a little bit tight. So what Jack is holding in his hand is actually gonna be a pipe or some sort of an extension bar that you can use to gain more uh, force with your uh, wrench or socket wrench. Tim, I wanna cut in real quick. Absolutely. We call this a cheater bar, and the reason we call it a cheater bar, if you'll hand me that, is if you slide it on here, you'll actually gain extra force and allow you to crack that blade free. Obviously, it gets tight on the unit. The other thing to note is we had already removed the spark plug boot from the spark plug itself, and why? Because we wanted to ground it out and make sure that no matter what we do underneath the unit, it does not allow it to rotate freely. Thanks for that, Jack. So, uh, we have already gone ahead and loosened this bolt up. The way we can show you guys a little bit more of blade removal. I'm removing the center bolt of this blade. I'll go grab a hold of this blade and hold it tight. While Tim's doing that, I'm going to go ahead and talk about some of the things that we do on these blades as to why you want an OEM blade. There's what's called a stake test. Literally, the unit is up and running at full RPM and a stake comes in from up underneath the machine. Doesn't matter the type of blade, but it comes up underneath the unit. We make sure that we do the right thing to protect the consumer. Second thing is what's called a ball test. A ball is put BB, it's a small BB, down into the unit. 
it hits the blade and it is only allowed to pass at a certain height away from the machine. That's the ball test. And of course, you guys can imagine you're in your yards, you hit a stake, you hit an ant hill, all these things occur, right? So what we're gonna make sure of is once you have the blade off, you can either A, replace it. Now this is a rider blade and we'll talk about that in a second, or you can sharpen it. So we wanna talk a little bit about sharpening. First thing is we have a hone kit and that hone kit uh, can be purchased in aftermarket. Obviously this is what the kit would look like. Okay, and I'm not gonna put that back up there, but this is a hone and you put it on a drill and what you do is you lock your blade into a vise and then you follow and mirror this exact same blade angle as you're going across there. Now what's important is when you are done, you clean the back edge because there's burring that'll occur on there, make sure everything's clean. And then last but not least, you'll see that this is a blade balancer. So the blade balancer moves back and forth on here. When you set the blade on, what you're looking for is to make sure it's level. If it's not, you need to take a little bit more off the side that is heavier. Absolutely. So that's what's going on there. All right, so uh, once, you, once you go ahead and you sharpen your blade, you ensure that it's balanced, you can go ahead and reinstall it in the machine. Or if you purchased a new blade, these are all critical things when going back together. So first of all, um, all of our blades from MTD are actually marked on the bottom side. They are actually stamped, it says bottom underneath of it. What you want to make sure is that that does go towards the grass. So the important thing to think of also is to look at the tips of the blades. Uh, these tips not only induce airflow underneath the deck of your blade, uh, but it also helps to uh, circulate the grass as it's being cut. These tips you actually want facing up towards the mower deck. Um, also you see in my hand is a blade adapter along with a, um, or a compression washer. So all of these things actually go in together to hold the blade on the mower deck um, accurate or adequately. So um, take my blade adapter. If you notice, um, it is designed for the blade on my mower. It does have two holes uh, to lock the blade into place along with a uh, pattern for this blade. Lock this all in. Make sure that the bend of my washer this is also important. The bend of my washer, if you look, I don't know if we can get, catch it on camera, uh, it actually does have a little like a U shape to it or a curvature. This curvature you want to go up towards the blade so that when you tighten the bolt down it actually compresses against the bolt in the, bl in the blade itself uh, to just keep this blade bolt locked into place. Tim, before you put that back on, go ahead and pull that back up, Dustin. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about rider blades because we have two blades here we can kind of talk about what happens under a twin bladed deck they need when they're swinging across they need to come within tip to tip contact within an eighth of an inch from one another what happens so many times and people say you know what my cut quality is not as good we get that but what's happening is you're sharpening your blade and this edge is starting to recess and go back towards the fin so you can imagine as it's coming across this way it no longer is within tip to tip so it's a really important thing on a rider especially that you do have good blades and if this is worn back or shaved back or been sharpened back that you go ahead and replace your blades because you want to make sure that you have tip to tip contact. The other thing is on the opposite side where it's rotating around the inside of the deck and we're going to talk more about riders in a second but this uh, blade needs to go up against that outside edge so everything is calculated when we have a premium cut. So I think we're good. We probably don't need to put that back on, but let's go ahead and talk about the rider stuff if you guys don't mind. No, that's absolutely, yeah, that's absolutely. great. I'll take that. Beautiful. Go over here. Yep, take this with you. Absolutely. I'll grab that. All right, so Jack had talked a little bit about uh, the, the blades and how they should cross each other and have that, that, that gap. Something also important when we get into quality of cut is actually going to be deck leveling. It's very important that when you um, not only check and sharpen your blades to get you a great cut, but a few other things you want to look at on the mower deck to, to start off with is going to be your deck level. So there's a few things to take into account as far as deck leveling goes. Uh, first of all, we're, what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you guys how to measure that. So if we go up underneath our deck, um, I'm going to reach under with my gloved hand, make sure that I have my mower blade um, off pointing to the side of the machine. I'm gonna take my um, measurement tool, which here uh, actually contacts underneath the blade, and it will give me a height of where my blade is from the ground. 
So I'll reach under here, make sure my blade is off uh, pointing uh, horizontally per se, or pointing at me. Take my measurement, I'll pull my gauge out, and it appears that, that I'm right about three and a half inches. So what I would want to do then is go to the other side of the deck. I want to take the same measurement. These, these measurements should basically be close to each other or within a sixteenth of an inch from your side to side. This is going to give you that quality cut. So let's say that that doesn't happen. Let's say when I take my measurement, my measurements are off. First thing you want to check is actually going to be tire pressure. That's where we would start. Getting your tire pressure gauge, you want to make sure that your front tires are equal, that my left front tire is within uh, the same pressure as my right tire, front tire. So front tire pressures are all going to be with, with inside of your owner's manual. The important thing to think about with that is though, you want to look at the sidewall of your tires. There is a maximum inflation. You do not want to inflate your tires higher than what's specified on the sidewall of the tire. So I'm going to go down here and we're going to go through just the whole deck leveling process with you guys. Start out and check my tire pressure. So, press this in, into the valve stem of the tire. It's actually going to give me a PSI rating. So our PSI right now looks about 13 PSI on my front left tire. And then I would go ahead and check the right front tire as well. Again, these should be close as far as pressures go. If I have 13 in my left front tire, I want to put 13 in my right front tire. And I would continue on and check my rear tires depending on uh, per owner's manual specifications and sidewall ratings. So this is a simple air compressor. Um, you can see it's quick connect, makes it very easy to move. Obviously it's not plugged in because we're in the, the garage here, but if you want to clean out your tires on a walk, you simply come over with a nozzle and you spray down your tires. Um, it's really important that they are clean. Why? Because we want to make sure that we do have a good even cut. Now over here, you can obviously change this out. It's called the tire chuck. Set down your air nozzle and you go ahead and put your tire chuck in. Now at this point, Tim would go ahead and put that on that valve stem, get it to the tire pressure that is necessary, and then go ahead and once again check. Now what's very unique about this air tool, if you give me that Tim for one Absolutely. second, is when it does come out, it's giving you a reading that stays and you can kind of see how it stays where it needs to be. So you can either inflate it or deflate it and, uh, and assist as far as it goes. We have a quick question coming in. How do you change the blade on the Bronco? Uh, I'm assuming that you're talking about the Bronco tractor um, and it would be the exact same way uh, as what we're talking about here. But because you asked that question, I'm gonna show you another way at home uh, that would make it very easy. We'll leave that sit on the ground. So if you take a piece of two by four, you can use it not only to chalk the blade from rotating up underneath the tractor instead of using the, uh, the lockout device, but you can also check to see how level it is. So you, what you would do is slide that up underneath, you take your blade and you lightly ding. This is soft, it's a two by four and it's soft. And honestly, what you could do there is ding it and then go to the other side and ding it again. And whatever that distance is between the two, right to left, you would make your deck adjustment uh, when you put the blades back on. But to take them off, you could simply put one of these up in there, jam the blade into position, and then go ahead and remove the nut. Next, they had a cheater bar that I showed earlier is an asset when it comes to the rider because obviously it takes a lot more force. So you could use that to very easily break the nuts and the bolts free from the bottom side of the deck. Absolutely. And that'll make it very easy. Absolutely, and I would definitely highly recommend that you get the blade, uh, the the blade holding tool that we just demonstrated. It, it, it's, a lot, it's a lot easier to use than a two by four and you can lock it into the side of your deck. This not only works on the push mowers, but it also does work on our riding lawn tractors and zero turns as well. Yeah, absolutely. So great question. Thank you very much, Anna, for that question. So as far as the deck goes, once you have it leveled side to side, what other people don't realize is you also have to have the right pitch forward. So these decks in general, they're gonna be about an eighth to a quarter inch pitch, if not three eighths, depending on the system and why. Because you wanna have maximum vacuum up into that deck. There are three functions for a deck. You have side discharge, which is a normal function. 
You have your bagging, which is a secondary function, and then you have mulching. Now with these systems in general, you change out to a mulching system, change the blades, change the, uh, the outside unit. So the three-in-one blades of the past that a lot of people use, we still have them in some uh, applications, we've gone to a two-in-one. That is a side discharge and bag because we want to have premium bagging uh, as far as operations go to the unit. And then you change out and go to a mulch system that would allow you uh, to, to mulch your grass and take care of any lawn debris or in the fall take care Absolutely. of your leaves. Yep. And then one other thing to add on with you, Jack, there, uh, as far as good quality cuts, mulching capabilities, in bagging capabilities, we talked about deck leveling, but there's one other thing that you want to talk, think about when, for, when we talk about quality of cut. Not only sharpened blades is, is huge, but making sure that the underside of your deck is clean. So, using our little... Uh, Take up the Mojack? Yep. yep. Using our plastic Please. scraper, these, these actually are better than the metal scrapers. Not only do they prevent scratching from the underside of the deck, but they also conform to the shape of your deck. So each spring, I would, I would actually recommend doing this after each mowing, looking up underneath your deck and making sure that that wet grass, especially in the springtime, because grass is much wetter in the spring, is not stuck to the underside of your deck. What that allows it to do is airflow moves, grass circulates, and you get a better discharge, and you get a better bagging or mulching um, capability as well. Now real quick, Tim, let's talk about what Dustin's doing. This is what's called a Mojack. So when you're in your yard, and if you just heard that click, that's actually the uh, lockout mechanism that puts it in its position. But it's really important to know that that type of device is available. A lot of people, oh, you know, I can't get up underneath my tractor. Uh, in general, you would chalk this deck at this point and make sure that the real, rear wheels are locked. You'd make sure that the parking brake is in position. So you'd push it down and then you would latch it into lock, right? Now it's not going to roll or do anything and then chalk the rear wheels. However, most people don't have a Mojack. Most people don't have a blade lock. We know that. So what I tell people to do is take your tractor because everybody wants to pull the deck. And if you do, let's just talk about that real quick. You can put a piece of visqueen or plastic on the ground, drive up over it, and now you have really a really low friction surface if you do that. Pull your tractor up over it. You can go ahead and lower the linkages on the deck. You know, just lower the deck down as you see here, and that'll allow that to sit on the ground at home. And then you can go ahead and remove the clips, the pins, the uh, drive belt itself. You gotta be careful if you had an electric clutch that you don't pull the wires. But at that point, it's very easy to pull from underneath the machine. And why? Because it's sitting on plastic. So you can imagine a little bit of a hockey rink right there. Be careful with your shoes, but your deck will come out easily. So it is a really important piece at home. Go to the curb, right up on the curb, lock your brake. Now you have that much more distance to do what you need to do very easily without a ramp. Make sure that you chalk your tires and lock your brake. Oh, well, that's great. So. This is a very simple process. It, it's not, it doesn't take much knowledge. It doesn't take much experience. You get your plastic scraper, you get up underneath your deck, and basically you're going to clean under the whole deck surface underneath here, getting out all that dried, packed grass, even if, if, if it's wet grass. Get all the whole deck surface underneath here with your plastic scraper. Uh, one other feature, one other option you have to, to assist you in that is going to be your deck wash. So on the top of this deck, in, in, for, for instance, uh, you see our deck wash adapter. Very important that you make sure you do this with a cool deck. So you want to make sure that uh, you actually uh, form this after you've mown and after the mower has, cool, has a chance to cool off. Or you want to do it, you know, pull it out of the garage, wash your, your deck out. So what's unique about this is you just go ahead and tighten this up. Always make sure that the gasket is inside of here. Obviously the unit would be on the ground, but we wanted to show you how it is. That's a quick connect. And you simply just go to the top of your deck and lock it in. So when it's sitting flat, now don't do it on your garage, don't do it on your driveway, do it in your lawn. Why? Because you're going to blow the debris out from underneath the machine. So you're going to literally get on the tractor, fire it up, blow the debris out onto your lawn, and then you're going to go ahead later when it dries up a little bit and rake it back off and there's no issues. So just know if you do it on your driveway, you're going to have the green stain, just takes a little while to get it off, but obviously that's part of a lawnmower. But we just wanted to show you very quickly what can be done with a quick connect. Type device and Dustin if you go ahead and put that back 
Uh, we're going to take this off real quick and we'll show it to everybody so they know what it is. And most people are used to this type of device as far as a quick connect. That's exactly what that air compressor used except for water. Okay. While we're here, I want to talk about the deck wheels. These are called anti-scalp deck wheels. And at the end of the day, on all riders in general, some of the smaller ones don't have them. And the reason being, you don't have as large a deck like an airplane. So here we do. You got two different kinds. Uh, this is a rear straight roller. And on the front, you can see it's curved. And the reason it's curved is because as you're moving left to right, that wheel will ride up over the ground in the terrain and make sure that the deck is moving with the undulations of the grass. So it's really important those are set right. So once you find where you want that deck to go, and it's really easy when it's in the air, but at the end of the day, you put your deck where it needs to be. You wanna put your hands between the bottom edge of these wheels and then set this up or down accordingly. You don't want it riding in the grass. These are not ground following decks. They do float, but they are not ground following. It's very, very important. So all of our tractors are like that. And why? Because you don't need the ground following application. Absolutely. So it's a really, really important thing. Tim, I think uh, while you scrape the deck, let's talk about the spindles and why they are the way they are. Yeah, absolutely. So we get a ton of questions from customers about why our spindles, um, some of the older versions had grease fittings, and now how, why our spindles today, we've removed those grease fittings and, and basically made them maintenance free. So the biggest reason is uh, our spindles are not only are, are set to be the life of the machine, uh, but they are also designed to be maintenance free. So the the, the bearings inside of them are actually sealed so we've packed them full of grease for you and um, you know it, it, we tend to not have any issues with with the, with the spindles themselves if if the machine is maintained correctly and we um, you know so that, I can imagine there's a lot of old hats I was one of them yeah. uh, in my prior lives but at the end of the day people don't have a grease gun so if I were to ask the uh, constituents out there how many of you have a grease gun I could just see all the huge hands rising here. <laughs> the reality is if you do you usually have grandpa's grease gun uh, or you're an enthusiast and you truly love doing that stuff and we get that. But what we've identified is consumers do not want to maintain the machines. Uh, they want it as simple as it can be and we want to build them that way. So each one of these units is built to X amount of hours of a lifetime of a machine, whether it's a walk or a tractor and then we make sure that we take care to make sure it lasts that long for the consumer. So you don't have to worry. The areas that do have grease fittings, it's because you need them to get to the full life of a tractor. And in general, a tractor's got about a 10 year life. So that's how we get here. But there, all of this uh, impacts your cut quality. So it's very, very important that we get to this point and make the necessary adjustments to this. So Dustin, if you'd be so kind and take down the uh, bow jack to the lower level, we're gonna move on. And in the interim here, if anybody's got questions or whatnot, we'll be glad to answer those questions. Absolutely. So we're gonna move into another area now, um, which is the air cleaner assembly. And air cleaners are a funny thing. Uh, I know you wanna show them this one, so if you'd be so kind and uh, go around yep, and pull absolutely. that out of there. Clear. So while Jack's getting his stuff around, it's very easy to get the air cleaner out of your unit. Uh, starting with the walk behind most of our engines, uh, you'll find the air cleaner opposite the muffler. Pulling the air cleaner cover, you'll see our paper element. So this paper element, once you remove it, uh, it's very important that you just take a brief moment and inspect yours at least seasonally. I would recommend personally re replacing it each season. But depending on your mowing habits and how often you mow, uh, you want to refer to the engine owner's manual as far as how often to service this. But what you're looking for in general is to make sure that this is clean, not full of debris, it's not wet, you don't have moisture, because these elements are paper. So uh, one, one other thing to, to look for is take your air filter and put it into the light. You should be able to see light through there. Uh, your, your engine is actually breathing through this piece of, of paper and filter. So if it is clogged, you're going to have performance issues with your lawnmower. So, oh, go ahead, Jack. I'm going to give you this okay. for one second. Absolutely. Here. These are several different elements that are out there. You can see this is pleated, but it, it's a little longer. Um, this is what's called a pre-cleaner. Uh, this is on your uh, uh, riders, on your base riders and the machines that are out there. Um, this is an air cleaner uh, that comes directly out of this. And there's a piece of the packaging, lovely. Uh, but at any rate, you have a pre-cleaner. 
Um, this pre-cleaner is very, very important that it's maintained properly. Now, if you take it off, I'm going to borrow that back from you, and I'm using this to make life simple without the compressor. Um, you can blow through these. You could use a little bit of soap and water and clean them. And again, hold them up to the light. If you can see through them, then they're probably still okay both ways. The same thing with what he was just talking about. When you hold that up to the light, you'll see through, of course. But what's most important about these uh, pre-cleaners, or the first uh, element itself, is when you are blowing through this, you want to blow through so it's going out. Think about it. When you're blowing in, if you're blowing dirt through here, what's happening with the dirt and debris? It's going into the intake of the engine, and we don't want that. So make sure when you blow these out that you blow across them. Make sure it's nice and light. Everything's cleaned up and ready to go. When you're ready to put these pre-cleaners back on again, regardless of the dual element or whatever is needed, you're going to take a little a sandwich bag. It's easy. Put this in a sandwich bag. Put a little bit of the motor oil that you have from the unit. Squeeze through it. Okay. Pull it back out. Dab dry it. And now you have a nice pre-cleaner to take care of your engine. So in this case, without dropping everything. In this case, you would have a pre-cleaner on the front side of here. You can see how that looks against the one we have here. And then on a dual element that comes out of a rider, this would actually ride up over the outside edge of here. So you would put that on the outside edge and then we'll go over and we'll show that in a second on the rider. Uh, we're gonna have the hood removed here in a second and then we'll go ahead and take a look at that. But we wanted to show you different types of air cleaners. There's many, many oh, of yeah. them always refer to the owner's manuals to make sure that you have the right stuff. And it's also very critical that you get the right filter. Um, uh, aftermarket air filters, air filters that, that are not designed by the engine manufacturer can be a different Micon rating. So with that being said, to keep your engine, engine running for the, the longest, uh, make sure you get the right air filters. But put this air filter back into this push mower. One thing to be very critical about is to make sure that this seal it's put back into the into the air box the way it was designed to be. So uh, this is the sealing surface to keep all that dirt and debris from going down inside your engine. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this fuel, or air filter, seat it down in here, make sure it's tight. And when I put this cover back on, this is another critical part. I want to make sure this cover goes into the right spot and snaps in so that I actually um, seal this air box completely off. Make sure it clicks and locks. Make sure it clicks, absolutely. So we're going to go over to the rider now, and we're going to take a look. But before we go there, we have a question um, from DJ Kennedy. Uh, my Troy Boat rider won't start. My brother-in-law gave it to me. I changed the gas that was in it. It has a new spark plug and fuel filter. Uh, any advice on what I could do? This is the number one question. Absolutely. We get asked by the droves, and here's why. Everybody leaves fuel in their machine. It just happens. There's not much you can do about it. So we're gonna walk you through because we've had thousands and thousands of these calls and we're gonna take it. So what makes an engine run? Three things, ignition, compression, and fuel, right? So to answer this question properly, we gotta talk about the fundamentals of what makes the engine do what it's gotta do, right? Yes. So we've just talked about air. No question about it, air is most important. And we're gonna finish off with the rider, but we'll go ahead and answer. Uh, this was on a rider, yes, on a rider. So we're actually gonna move to the rider and we'll try to take you through some steps as we go here that might get you back up and running. And then we're gonna tell you some do's and don'ts as far as that's concerned. Tim, Absolutely. let's take off the air cleaner. Go ahead and take that handle off of there and hand that to Dustin. Yeah, I'll grab that and hand it off to Dustin. Thanks so, so much. Same, same concept applies to the, to the lawn tractors themselves. So you have an air filter cover, an air box cover, uh, you'll call it different names. Go ahead and pop the releases, remove the cover, unseat your air filter. And again, we're looking for the same things that we looked for on the, on the walk behind. You're checking your pre-cleaner, want to make sure this isn't all clogged up with dust, dirt, and debris. Want to make sure that, uh, that it, in fact, it's not disintegrating, because what we do see is that is they sit in the air box for long periods of time. Uh, this foam will actually start to disintegrate. It crumbles up in your hand. If you get those things, you should actually replace both elements. I repl they come in one package, just replace both. But same concepts as the walk behind. You want to take your, your air filter, Hold it up to the light, make sure you can see through it. Want to make sure that, that you don't have any rips or tears or any dis disintegration between these two. So I'm going to jump in and we're going to talk about a very important thing that people love to do. 
They love to take starting fluid, <laughs> not use starting fluid. I know that's what everybody wants to do. Why? Absolutely. We're going to spray it in and we're going to get this thing running. Here's the problem with that. You may blow a head gasket or actually damage the engine. Why? It's a super high compression when that happens because the blow off is grander than what you need. So what you really need is a carbon choke cleaner. And these generally come with a straw uh, that'll allow you to go ahead. If your carburetor is gummed up, that's what we call it, um, from debris or whatever it might be, this will give you that real quick go. Now, really quickly, um, there's a hole in the top of the air cleaner box assembly. And literally, you'll take this, you'll spray it down in there with a couple sprays, get back on the product and see if it fires up. If it does fire up, you now know it's fuel. So we're gonna take you through a couple other things here, but I can't tell everybody enough, do not use starting fluid in your machine, you're gonna hurt your engine. So stay with carbon choke cleaner, it'll make it easy. Now, this straw is made for other applications where you can use it as a cleaner, you can do. This gives you a little more octane boost, it'll get you going. If this doesn't get you going, more than likely, when we check all the other things, you got something going on that is above and beyond. And we're gonna talk about a couple of those items. So I thought, Tim, that what we could do since we're here and we were asked this question is yep. take them through the fuel filter. Oh, absolutely. I'm gonna give you that. Oh, cool. Yeah, so another part of maintenance is gonna be fuel filters. So again, in your engine owner's manual, you should have some sort of chart, a maintenance chart that will say, you need to change your fuel filter in X amount of hours or seasonally. This is one of those other components. So fuel filters, uh, very simple to install. Couple precautions, you wanna make sure you have some sort of eye protection because this is a fuel line. So gasoline is in here. Uh, if your fuel tank is full, you're gonna to wanna to pinch off the fuel line. So to stop that, that fuel from escaping your fuel tank. Once you remove the two clamps, you clamp your fuel line, you wanna take a look at your fuel filters. So I'm gonna bring this in so everybody can see it. Uh, fuel filters are directional. So you can, th these can only be installed one way. With this, this filter anyway, you're gonna, if you see the arrow, that's gonna be the direction of fuel flow. So if we look on our rider, for instance, I have a fuel tank and an engine. My fuel filter is in between. I want fuel to travel towards the engine. So what I'm gonna do is take the arrow on my fuel filter and I'm gonna install it so that the arrow points towards the engine. So other things you wanna keep in mind. So let's say you are following your maintenance guide in your engine owner's manual. If you start to see uh, any type of debris or any type of floaties as we sh some people usually call them um, inside your, your filter where it looks like there's dirt, rust, something that would been, could have been out of your gas can, it could have been out of the fuel, the fuel pump. Uh, if you start to see those things, I would re highly recommend that you change these. Hey, we got a good question that just came in, Tim, and I think it's important to talk about this. Um, I want to reiterate two things. Number one, I want to finish off with this fuel because this has to do with this question. I'll read it in a second here. Okay. Um, but as far as fuel goes, always understand that you're dealing with fuel. So you want a cold operation, meaning you want it cold. Yes. You don't have to worry about that. You want to pinch off the inlet line like we talked here to make sure that there is an addition and you want to put something underneath that fuel to catch that fuel, you know? So we don't have an issue on the ground or have anything of that nature. So a question just came in, it says, do I need to oil the pre-cleaner after purchasing a new rider or walk behind before the first use? That is all done from the factory. Yeah. However, and I want to be clear on this, if, it, if you can't breathe through it, it can't breathe through it. So when I tell you to put this in a little bit of oil, submerge it, squeeze it, and dab it out, you still want to hold it up here because all you're doing is collapsing those microns that are coming through there, and you're making sure it's catching the debris. So the answer back is you're good uh, preliminarily up front, but yes, down the road, your pre-cleaner will definitely save your air cleaner and uh, keep everything flowing smooth. But remember, if you over oil this and it's saturated or it's dripping, that's no good. What you're yep. looking for is to squeeze it out, put it back on here, and the idea is that the engine still breathes well. So I hope I answered that question well for you. I, I believe that we've, uh, we've got that covered. Nope, I, I think we're good. No, so we're good as far as that goes. So right now we got air, right? We got gas, and now we gotta take a look at spark plug. So in this case, there's two of them. I'm gonna give one to Tim over here. Oh, that's great, thank and you. you can show them the core and the projection on there. Yeah, so uh, we've got our core and our projection. Um, we're, gonna get, we're gonna talk a little bit about spark plug gap in just a moment, uh, but the, this is the critical part of your spark plug that actually causes 
uh, the combustion to happen inside the engine. So um, we're sending the electrical signal through the, the top here. It goes through the, 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 um, the center and comes out the, uh, the end. So yep, that's a layman's term. Yep. So now we'll talk a little bit more detail. So yep. there is actually a gap in there. It's hard to see. This is what's called a gapping gauge and it makes it very simple. Um, you will go to the manual, it'll tell you, set it at 30,000, 35,000, whatever it may be, but you're going to make sure that you get. These are all preventative maintenance items that need to be done. We suggest that it's at least once a year, if not more, depending on the hours of usage. Yeah. But in general, if you were to look at this, you'll see that it goes from thinner to thicker. And the idea is on the front plate, there's a number. And in this case, we want to set it to 30,000. So what we're going to do is we're going to bring this around. We're going to set it at 30. What you don't want to do is this, because all you're going to do, yeah. you see it's getting wider and wider, right? And if you do, you simply take the gauge and you push that back down again, and you go ahead and you reset that at 30,000. Now, what's extremely important is what Tim was talking about, this distance. Do not buy or put a plug in that you don't know is for your machine, okay? It depends on how old it is, but you could poke a hole in the older systems. Yeah, you could hurt the top of the engine, or worse yet, you could blow these threads out. So we want to make sure that you do this properly. So we just talked about air, right? And what did I say earlier? Fuel, okay? And now you have spark, so here's spark. So years ago um, and today, if you really want to look at your spark, there's what's called a spark plug gauge. And that's this here. That gauge hooks between this boot, which is right here, and you would go to a ground. So I'll make it so the cameras can see it like this. So if I were to pull this over and everything were hooked up properly, you could actually see that spark going across that gap. And then this, in this case, you could adjust this depending on where you need that spark to come across and how much you can actually adjust this gauge to see it. But what we're looking for is spark. So ignition, compression, and fuel. We always joke around because an engine has four strokes. Suck, squeeze, bang, blow. I know it's funny, but the reality is that's what it's doing. So you can imagine it's sucking it in, right? It's collapsing it, waiting for the spark, and of course it's gonna bang it off, okay? And then it's gonna blow it out. So that's how the function of the engine works. In general, I can tell you this, it's usually fuel related when you can't start your machine and it's because it's sat for a long period of time. There's a carburetor on there. Obviously it has a float that's a, like a valve, just like your spigot on your house and it opens and closes. In this case, it moves down and comes up. They stick. So a lot of times when you have debris in there, if you use the carbon choke cleaner in the intake, you could do the exact same thing on this walk. But be cautious, if you're with somebody, always make sure that you're using the proper protocol. In this case, you pull this back, you're standing behind the machine, you're gonna pull it over. You may get a plume of smoke or whatever it may be. And let's talk about that plume of smoke. So what a lot of people do is they grab their mower, they go to the local dealer or where they're gonna get it repaired, and they put it where? In the back of their car. Yeah. That's fine, here's the problem. It's bouncing up and down as it's going down the street. So what's it doing? It creates a pump. So it can pump fuel, it can pump oil, it can pump a lot of stuff. Mm -hmm. Then you're turning it and rotating it in the back of your car to get it there, right? And then you go to start it up and what do you see? <laughs> this big plume of smoke comes out. Depending on if it's blue or black, that's a whole nother ball game as to what it's doing. But at the end of the day, that's what that plume of smoke is. It doesn't know what to do with either the oil or the fuel. And that's what ends up happening is you end up with this big plume. So if you happen to roll it over or do whatever, we're gonna talk about oil changes in a second. That would be something that, uh, that you'd wanna pay attention to if you're gonna transport the unit because you are gonna have it. Here's the worst case scenario. The oil comes out, it makes it to the air cleaner, right? And once again, you can't breathe, it can't breathe, and therefore it doesn't suck in the air that it needs to go. So the question we have is, are the fuel filters universal or are there different sizes? Um, so the first thing is you wanna to go to your operator's manual. That's where you wanna get the information, right? And if it doesn't give it to you there, take a look at what the engine uh, manual has to say, and then you go even further and we identify. So in this case, are they universal? They are not. Um, there are different fuel filters. Can you use a universal? Yes. However, we talked about not being able to breathe here. We'll just use this uh, for that uh, analogy. So you can see as I pull this, it gets thinner, right? So those fuel filters inside, 
have different what they call microns, and it allows X amount of flow through the system. So it comes from your fuel tank, yep. through the micron uh, of the fuel filter, and into your engine. So it's stopping that bad pollution, or in this case, debris, from coming to your engine. So if you put the wrong micron and it's too small, it's just trying to, like, breathing through these fantastic masks that we have. At the end of the day, when they start to get debris in them, obviously they're very difficult to breathe through. It's the same thing for your engine. Absolutely. So I think that should help everybody as far as that goes. So let's talk about fuel additive real quick here. We can talk about Stabil. Sure, yeah. So realistically, we talked about fuel issues and fuel itself is good for about 30 to 60 days on the shelf, depending on what blend of fuels are around. Biggest thing to think about with that is, um, as the fuel sits in your gas tank, it'll actually start to separate. And it also has an additive with, uh, with ethanol. So what you're gonna get there is it's actually gonna start to attract water. To prevent that, we have a lot of different additives. There's a ton of stuff that's being sold on the shelves. Uh, the biggest recommendation that, that I would say uh, for fuel additives, I mean, there's, they're, they're all about the same. They all have the same performance. I would just look on the back of the bottle and actually look at what the manufacturer specifications are. Some of them will say that, you're, that it'll, it'll keep fuel uh, good for 120 days or six months or there's really no specifics except for what's on the back, back of those manuals. However, there's a caveat to that is, is that that's not a guarantee that your fuel is going to be good. Uh, it all depends on how you store it, what type of container you're storing it in. So if you put it in just a five gallon bucket, which most people don't, you go out and buy a gas can, but depending on if you're not running a cap on top of your gas can, if you, you have no funnel, if it's just an open fill neck, uh, that, that's, that allows those, that moisture to get inside. It allows debris to come inside. So it's very important that you, you store fuel in a very good sealed appropriate container. And if you are planning on storing your machine or storing the fuel for an extended period of time, you use some sort of fuel stabilizer and you follow the instructions on the back of those bottles. Yep, and I'm gonna reiterate this again. Do not put the fuel stabilizer in the machine. You put it in your fuel storage can. And the reason being, it's set up for X amount of quantity and you're gonna put that in there, shake it up, and you're gonna be good to go. So a lot of people love when there's large fuel capacities like you see on the rider. They love to do it right in there. It's not wise by any means. You wanna make sure that you do it, that you shake it up, and that you have a good uh, scenario as you move forward. So we talked about ignition, we talked about compression. So let's talk a little bit about compression. Obviously the spark plug that came out of the spark plug hole, that's where you would check compression. Now in general, that's a little tougher to do today with overhead valve engines and why? Because it's pretty far inside of there. So as you know, it's gotta go way down and inside. However, um, you can uh, pull the boot to the side, and I can't tell you enough, make sure the boot is away from you, but you can check that compression at the top of the piston. The problem is that you're gonna be either pulling it over or cranking the engine, so you wanna be extremely careful as you do that. But yes, you could check compression. If you have a compression issue, whether it's a valve that's hung up, uh, whether it's a gasket that blew, or you use starting fluid and blew your head gasket, sorry to say, but that's what'll happen, uh, you definitely wanna get it up to a local dealer and have them take a look at the product. So we deviated a little bit to answer a question or two, but we're gonna come back over here. Go ahead, Tim. Yeah, absolutely. So um, kinda wanna go through, uh, we talked about spark plugs, checking spark. We talked about the air filters. We've talked about some of the deck things. A uh, couple other adjustments that we want to discuss, especially on a uh, lawn tractor, is going to be your front tires. So just like a car, just like anything else that has a steering wheel, there's, there's a front tire alignment that's very critical. Uh, so we get a lot of calls about turfing, and we get a lot of calls about uh, front tire wear. So a few things to think about. For, and at least the big one for us is in your owner's manual it talks about a toe-in adjustment. So that adjustment is nothing more than, than if you look at the front of this machine, we have tie rod ends. Those tie rod ends can be loosened, they can be screwed in, they can be screwed out. That, that allows the front tires to either come farther out or come farther in. Uh, that would be your toe-in adjustment. So big thing you want to think about if you look inside your manual, it will give you uh, unit specific instructions. For this tractor and, and a generic kind of de demonstration, you're going to want to measure from the front of your tires across, and you're going to measure from the back of your tires across. What we're really looking for is about a, a quarter of an inch 
from to three eighths of an inch of toe in. So you actually want the tires pointing into each other. Um, in our case, that would be there. Um, if not, so if your tires do not point that way, it's nothing more than loosening this lock, this jam nut, screwing the, the uh, tie rod in or out, tightening the jam nut back up, or you measuring just to verify that you've got where you want to be, and then um, go out and test drive your machine. So something I want to point out, you may say, man, do I really have to do this adjustment? Well, we put them on there so it lasts the lifetime of the machine. So, you know, when we build our machines, we have an expectation and those are there because we want to make sure that it lasts. And I'm talking everything as far as tires and everything. Yeah. Now, we can't control some of the environment. You're in sandy conditions. Obviously, you're going to have some uh, different deterioration. But in general, what he's talking about measuring the outside, the outside of the tire in this case is very critical. You want it slightly towed in, so that's what's important. Now, some of you may say, hey, you know what? My tires kind of sit in an angle inward. Depending on the geometry of the unit and how it's built per platform, this one is unique. This is using an automotive type steering, where well, the other one uses a very uh, tractor-like steering, where it comes up from that drag link and a cross link, and obviously what they're doing is getting your turning radius by pitching the tires in. These sit more like a bulldog, like this, but they oversteer. So if you were to watch and I was to crank this, you would see that tire would go to a center pivot point here, and the other tire would do the same. Why is that so critical? Because in this case, you're going to get a true automotive type steering. They call it Ackerman geometry, and it allows you to have a better steer. So what I'm going to tell everybody while we're talking about tires, sure. don't check the toe in from the center of the tire to the center of the tire. Everybody likes to go where it's seamed together in the center of the tire. And the reason being, you have a plus or minus tolerance on these tires. Yep. So when they come out of that mold and they're made and they cool, there is a plus or minus on there. So we need to make sure that we are getting it to the right point. So go to the outside. So I want to talk about bushings versus bearings. Let's go ahead and look at the steering system. A sleeve bushing that is made to last X amount of hours will do so. A bearing is going to give you a little better, smoother ride. So it just depends on which one you want to go with, and obviously that's part of it. These are sleeve bearings that, that we put up on these walk-behinds. And why? Because they're very simple. They don't run 100 miles an hour. They're very easy to use. Now, we do have options when it comes to these tractors. We use a sleeve bearing and we use a ball bearing. And the ball bearing is going to give you that. So just like a bicycle tire, when you pull it, you're going to get that. However, all of them are made for the lifetime of the machine. So I got a question coming in. How do I keep my tires from going flat? Oh, what a beautiful That's segue. That's a beautiful question. Beautiful Yeah, question. absolutely. So I'm going to finish with these bushings. Just know there are different bushings. They last long and they have to do their thing. And this actually applies to this because if we got something going on and we're causing that tire to go flat, that's another uh, opportunity. Yeah, so, and I'll, I'll just kind of dive right into that. So to, how to keep your tires from going flat? First of all, uh, is when you bring it out of the shed for your first time mowing, uh, you want to make sure you inflate your tires back to what the manufacturer specification is. So uh, whatever tire you have, make sure you look in your owner's manual and just inflate them. As the machines sit over winter, just like your car, you know, everybody had their car in, in the winter time, uh, you get your low pressure, your low tire pressure light comes on. Basically, as the air, as it gets colder outside, your tire pressure drops. That's going to be the same concept for these. So um, inflating them all the way to where what, what's stated in the owner's manual is step one. Also, um, if you've done that and your tire continues to lose pressure, uh, you have a couple options. So um, A, you can replace the tire. Um, or B, if you don't want to invest in a new tire, you can look into, into tire additives, more like tire slime. Uh, very simple process to do tire slime. So uh, let's say my front tire on this rider is actually going low um, and, I, and I can't get it to stay inflated. So uh, what you would need is a few tools, starting out with a valve core remover. Uh, you can get these pretty much at any, any local hardware store. Uh, it has a little thing so you can remove the center of the tire core. Um, you're going to remove uh, the core of our tire. I'm not going to do it because I don't want to make this tire go flat. But once it's removed, you take your slime or wh whatever additive you're going to put into your tire, uh, fill that with the appropriate amount of, of chemical that's listed on the bottle. Um, each manufacturer is going to be different, so it'll tell you to put X amount of ounces uh, per tire size. Once I put in the amount, I'm going to put my valve stem back or valve core back in. At that point, you would take your air compressor, uh, 
Again, low pressure, low volume. You want to go ahead and do as slow as you can. Uh, inflate the tire pressure to the recommended specification. Um, again, thinking about not to uh, extend or exceed the maximum PSI in the tire. Uh, this is one of those situations you do not have to overinflate the tire. Inflate it to your, your desired tire on the front there. And as somebody's inflating it, push it very quickly. It'll open it up, it'll seal itself to the outside of that bead and get it up and running. The tire straps work well as long as it hasn't been sitting too long and the tire is malformed. Because if that happens, yeah. you're gonna have some issues. Last thing that I wanna point out, that valve stem, when you, when you pull it out of there and put the slime in, it's gotta have some room to go in. So if it's sitting on the ground and the valve stem's on the bottom and you're trying to fill it without jacking it up, you're not gonna get the slime in there for it to rotate. And what you can do, which is nice once you get it up and running, is spin it right there in the air and then go drive it around. And generally what happens there, you drove over a staple, some hawthorns, who knows what you drove over right. in the yard, or you simply didn't keep up with the tire pressure. And I'm gonna reiterate that too. The tire pressure is on the outside of the tire. You need to identify that and that's where you wanna go. Um, one of the big questions that comes up all the time is why are my tires overinflated when I get the machine? Oh yeah. That has to do with degradation over time when we're shipping in a pallet. So as the units come into you, we overinflate them because they're going to lose X amount of PSI over X amount of months. So we go ahead and put up. So if you happen to see one that is down, I apologize for that. Sometimes they catch it with a, a forklift or uh, things happen. But you can simply bring it up in the air. If you don't have uh, you know, that type of capability, just get the tire up in the air somehow, some way. And at that point, you can go ahead and blow it back up. Again, you can reseal the bead and you're off on. The bead is the outside perimeter. I should be very clear on that. That's the outside perimeter between the rim and the tire itself. But these are all things that in the, in the springtime, all of you are facing. We know. I, you, you think we don't face yeah. this? Of course we do. <laughs> so I apologize for hitting the mic. But at any rate, that allows you to get everything running. Now we have our tires. The outside diameters are correct. Let's talk about tires for a minute on a zero turn. I think it's extremely important. By the way, everything we've talked about so far applies to a zero turn. Whether it's an air cleaner, a spark plug, two spark plugs, right? Ignition, compression, and fuel. And all of that applies so far. Now. On a drive system, if this wasn't a push and it was a drive, it would have one drive, a rear wheel drive, or it would have a front wheel drive. And we can talk through cleaning that in a minute. A rider in general has a differential type of, of drive. It could be a seven speed, it could be a six speed on a smaller unit. It could be an auto drive, which is using variable speed, or it can be a hydrostatic transmission, which is what we use in our uh, top end uh, products. Why? Because they're liquid drive, they're very forgiving, and they operate for a very long period of time. So, on a zero turn, you have two hydrostatics, one on the right and one on the left, and they have to be in sync. So some of the things that we hear uh, as we go through this is, hey, listen, um, I need to replace my spark plug. Same is what we talk. I need to replace my air cleaner. Same is what we talk. In fact, they use these same engines, no question about it. But then the last question is like, you know, I'm going across my yard, tires, and it's not tracking properly. You get one lap bar in front of the other lap bar, and we've all seen this. Um, and when it does that, it's just simply out of adjustment from the linkages to the hydrostatics themselves. So they're in neutral and they have to open and that's literally what's going on. And you have to make the proper adjustment. So as you're going across your yard, you end up like this or like that. That is where that adjustment is made between the handlebars, the, the uh, trunnions going to the rear or the adjustments and to the hydro. Once you've done your tires, making sure they're round on a zero turn, making sure they're equal, okay, that's done. You got caster wheels, that's important. And then you have this adjustment that needs to be made uh, to the hydrostatic unit. Something else to pay attention to, there is what's called a hydro dump valve in the rear. That's literally its name. Why? It allows you to roll the machine around. It is extremely important because people forget about it. They put their unit away for the winter and they're like, boy, my drives aren't working. Make sure that those are fully engaged and that'll allow your hydros to function. Absolutely. So that's a little bit about that. I'm gonna put this away. So now we're gonna go and we're gonna take a look at the oil change. And we're gonna walk you through some of the simpler things as far as oil changes. A, a, a question just came through. If I need to replace a tire, how should I lift up a mower if I can't use the jack or rest in a curb? Um, uh, is there a special tool or something that you can use? 
That is a tough one, and I will be honest with you, uh, because the front axles pivot. Unfortunately, the tire that is lower, there's not an easy way to do that. But I can tell you, jacks are very inexpensive today. You can go down to the local uh, store and pick one up and jack that front, and you'll use it for other applications. It won't just be for your rider, but it would allow you to do a lot of other things, including like we were looking at cleaning the bottom of the decks or whatever. So there are a lot of other issues there. Uh, is there a spot to use a regular car jack? The answer is yes. Uh, you would not want to use it, obviously, up underneath the muffler. Uh, you would use <laughs> it on your front pivot axle. Uh, you could lock the axle and wedge it if you so choose, but you could push it. If you're in the rear, there's a rear hitch plate, and you could push the rear hitch plate up in the air, and obviously the two tires. What you got to be careful of there is that it doesn't fall off your jack stand. So the best thing to do there, jack stands are inexpensive as well. Um, pick two up, throw them in the back side down there, make sure it's secure, and that's how you really want to work on the product. Yep. Now, there is one way to do it backyard style. Uh, we use that curb again, and if that tire is low, you can pull up the tire that's good on a curb, chalk and lock everything, and you will have a tire that's up in the air. But again, it's kind of dangerous, so be careful with that. You know, a lot of people come up with all kinds of unique ways to do things. <laughs> secure the product. That's the one number one thing that's most important, secure yeah, the product. So I hope that helped. Um, as far as hydrostatic fluids go, or let's walk through some drives uh, before we hit this real quick while okay. we're on drives. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, variable speed, it's been around for us for many, many years. Uh, in fact, you see all these cars going to variable speed drives. So it's nothing new. Um, they're very, very resourceful and they work extremely well. So when we do six speeds, for instance, all we're doing is moving inside of a pulley and the opposite is going the other way. And that's what's given us our ratio of movement. When you have an auto drive type unit or a, a variable speed uh, foot control unit, all you're doing is pushing one belt inside and one belt outside. Now, why am I bringing this up? Because some of you may have lost that drive over the winter. It sat, uh, you left it in a certain position that it's got a little bit of a woe uh, in the belt. Obviously, you'll get that little pulsation as you're going across your yard. It will come out of there, but it sat too long in that position. So what happens is you get a little bit of a thump there, but it'll eventually go away. On a hydrostatic drive, they are uh, sealed. They're called uh, they're, uh, IZTs or EZTs or IHTs. There's many, many acronyms for them, but in general, they're an integrated hydrostatic transmission. That means the drive system and the hydraulic fluids are all in one. So that makes it very easy. Um, as far as topping them off, you don't need to. I know many go, but I want to, I get it. Uh, go to the owner's manual. It'll tell you what the fluids are in there and it'll tell you how to take care of that. Um, the issue is on AHTs, they are integrated and locked for life, so you don't have that. However, on a zero turn, like a ZT2800 type unit, uh, they do have the ability to go ahead and change those. Why? The higher you go up in the status, you drive them longer, they're going to give you more capability. So it's just something you need to pay attention to. If you need to have that taken care of, a local dealer can absolutely help you take care of that. So. I'm going to come off of transmissions now. All right. Why don't we go ahead and do some oil change? Sure. Can yeah. Show them what we got. Yeah. We need the oil pan. I think I have it. Here it is. Yeah. Before we get into oil changes, though, I kind of want to talk a little bit about oil. So while Jack's getting that ready, I'll grab our, our oil here. And a couple things to be mindful of. First of all, there are all different types of oil that's out there. Uh, it is very important that you look and you read your engine owner's manual and you find out what oil that, that is used for your machine. Um, not every machine anymore takes just a straight SAE 30 or 10W30. It all depends on the engine manufacturer and how the unit's been designed and tested. So uh, here's a typical bottle of oil. I want to look at, uh, if you look here, it says SAE 10W30. So this is a multi-viscosity oil. Um, so it is designed um, for not only a little bit cooler temperatures, but also warmer temperatures as well. Uh, and it, looking at our push motor here, uh, it does call that, tell us that we need 10W30. Um, some of our engines do have stickers on, on them around the dipstick area to tell you what oil that you need. Uh, so for this one, like I said, it's, it does say 10W30. Tim, uh, I want to jump in real yep. quick, not to interrupt you, but what's really important about viscosity is overhead valve engines need that in general. They need to move from a thinner weight to a heavier weight as they're uh, functioning like your car. And it's really important because if you're in a certain temperature and it's hot and you put the wrong fluid in there, you're gonna overheat. That's all there is to it. Or vice versa, you're in really cold spring temperatures and you go to pull that rope and it won't pull out of there, that's because the engine oil is too thick. So that's what these multi-grade oils allow you to do is have that ability. 
So what we're going to do now is kind of walk you through uh, best practices um, as far as changing your oil on multiple products. Sure. Yep. Well, first thing uh, that, that, that I like to do before I use any machine is actually check the engine oil. So um, before we change it, talk about checking it. Uh, each, most engines or almost all engines have a dipstick. Um, if they don't, they usually have a plug. And basically what you're looking for is that the oil is resting right at the bottom of the threads of that plug. Our engines here happen to have dipsticks. So I want to pull out my cloth rag here and it's very important that you use it more so of a terry cloth versus a cotton rag like Jack's holding in his hand. Uh, what happens is, is some of these fuzzies will come off onto your dipstick and actually get down inside the engine. So use a uh, non-fuzzy cloth. So uh, try to avoid some of that microfiber stuff too. I know they're becoming really popular now. I'll get you more of a terry cloth. Uh, cheese cloth works well too. Uh, but wipe, you want to wipe your dipstick off after you pull it out. Uh, you want to take a look at your dipstick itself. So uh, I have a bottom here and then I have a top and in between there you can see all this X's or what we like to call cross hatching. Uh, you want that oil level to reside somewhere within these cross hatch marks. If you don't see any oil on the dipstick, you don't have any oil on your engine. And just as bad, if you have oil that's above those cross hatches, your engine is over full in oil. What you're going to get from that is, is you're going to get smoking because the engine is going to start pumping the oil out of the engine to, because it's too full and it's actually going to start consuming some of it, which means burning it. So you're going to get those, you know, blue clouds of smoke coming out of your machine um, as you tip and turn and things of that nature. So that's a quick and easy overview how to check it. So we're going to get into to, to changing the oil on your push mower. Uh, the, most of these, uh, you have a few options, but most of them are, are more of a dump out, refill style system. So if you notice I have the dipstick removed, I have my drain pan down here on the floor. I can physically grab this, this push mower and tip it over to the side and dump the engine oil into my drain pan. So what's important about that, if your machine is up and running, is go ahead and let it run for a little while. Mm -hmm. And the reason being, you want that fluid to all be warm. It'll pour out much easier. We're back to yes. that thickness again. So get it up and running, let it run for a little while, shut it off, be cognizant that it's warm, pull your spark plug boot just like we did uh, yep. earlier and you see it's still laying to the side and then you're just gonna take it and tip it. Now, if you are not brawny and you uh, have an issue with pulling it, you can put your foot to the side of the rear wheel and then at that point you can tip it directly into that oil container and make it a lot easier on you. Now, Tim, make sure you talk to them about this. I'm gonna go ahead sure. and do that. But I wanted to show them what we're using here. No, yeah, that's... That's one of my kids' old t-shirts. And the reason I'm showing that is nothing <laughs> wrong. We're in a garage and it is a very clean uh, towel to use. There's nothing wrong with that. Just make sure that it is clean. Yeah, so uh, just to kind of announce, uh, continue on what Jack was pointing out. So if you look at our oil uh, bottles, uh, there's a taper, a long taper on one side. This is actually this, the, the part of the bottle you want facing down that you'll pour from. Uh, this allows the pour to happen and gives you, leaves you room from air so you don't get that surge of oil to where we've all made messes before in the past. Uh, if you look at this bottle of oil, it's a little bit larger, has more uh, um, quantity of oil. Uh, it's just built the same way. So you're pouring, you're going to want to pour from this way, um, if that makes sense to everybody. So uh, once we get your oil drained in the machine, you want to open up your engine owner's manual. You want to look in there and, and verify the quantity of oil that goes back in here. Um, you can use, you, that, that's the preferred method. Um, so once you figure that how much oil you need in here, you would open your, your bottle of oil, fill with, with the appropriate amount of, of desired oil or what, what it's specified as. Insert your, your dipstick. Um, pull it out and just verify that you have filled the, the engine to the appropriate level. Now something very important while he's holding that there, always check to see is it at the top that you just touch it and you check it or you go all the way yes, in and check gonna, it. Yep. Very, very important on walk or rider engines. All right, so that takes care of a walk, and I think uh, we've pretty much explained everything that goes on there. Now, if this was a self-propel unit, 
Obviously, if you have the slant, which a lot of them do, even the ones that don't have the slant, what's most important is that you're not putting any fluid into the carburetor. So always look for the air cleaner side, where is the carburetor and what can you do? Now, for some crazy reason, your fuel is loaded up, I would recommend running it down and out before you do this. That would be number one. Or you can take a sandwich bag, put it across the top of that and tighten it down and it'll create a seal and it'll stop it from dripping, okay? Just simple little things that you can do at home, that way you don't have a big mess. Just run it out of fuel. It makes it a lot easier. Change your, or your oil and you're off and running. So let's Great go ahead, point. here comes the fun part. Yeah, so moving on to the rider, it gets a little bit uh, easier per se. So uh, draining oil in the rider is, is simple, I, I would say. Uh, for some of our riders, we have a quick turn drain, which I'm gonna demonstrate momentarily. Uh, you guys can all see the, the yellow um, component there with the tube. Uh, these hoses will come in, should be in the manual bag of your rider. Uh, our zero turns have a hose style assembly with a, with a plug at the end. Um, if you don't have this quick turn, there should be just a plug in general there, uh, all located within the same spot. So uh, for, our, for this rider, I'll, I'll, I'll show you guys, uh, there's a little, I'll get my drain pan here. I've got my black cap. So if I flip this black cap open, I can then insert my hose. So real quick on the hose, you can keep watching Tim. That hose is extra long. We made that. Make it super simple, right? You're in your garage, you don't want a mess. So we made the hose longer than the one that comes with the unit. The one that comes with the unit does just fine. We wanted to make it easy to go right into the pan. Absolutely. So uh, with my hose installed, I'm going to go ahead and, and quarter turn this counterclockwise and then pull it out. If you notice with my other end of the tube in, in the drain pan, you're going to notice the oil start to flow out. Um, once you have drained the engine oil completely, you can push the drain back in, quarter turn it clockwise, it'll actually lock in. You can remove your hose, wipe up your mess, and uh, insert the, the plug cap at the end of that. Thank you, sir. Uh, uh, one thing on that, and you can see that we've dripped a little because we're playing games. Uh, make sure that you open the oil dipstick. It'll allow pressure to be relieved from the engine and it'll allow that flow to come out of there quicker. Now what's nice about it, you leave it on there, it also resists some of the flow and it maintains as, it, as it's coming through and out. So just something to keep in mind. Absolutely. So continuing on with your, your lawnmower oil change. Uh, once you have the oil drained out, uh, your dipstick would obviously be open like Jack had stated. Now, the last thing you're going to look at is your oil filter. So if your engine has an oil filter, it needs to be changed every time you remove or change the oil in your engine. Um, so uh, very simple process. Most of these unscrew by hand. If yours is very tight, you can get an oil filter wrench at, at a local auto parts store um, or a, on the internet. There's a lot of places to get them. Key things to remember, once you've removed this old oil filter, you're gonna to wanna to have something underneath the oil filter itself because when you unscrew it, it's still full of oil. Um, so you're gonna have oil leaking out. Uh, same thing when it applies, when you pull it off the machine, you wanna to try to hold it upright like this so the oil isn't spilling all over yourself. Um, when you go back on with the new filter, so I'm gonna insert my new filter, it's very critical that you not only wipe the engine off where the, the oil filter seats, but you take some of that new oil or old oil and you actually lubricate the seal on this oil filter. What happens is, is when you screw this on, this is rubber, so when it meets the engine block, if you don't lubricate this, you can have a tendency to tear this or, or dislodge it to where you'll have an oil leak. Um, and then it, you're, at some point your engine would run low on oil and you can actually damage components. Absolutely. So that in a nutshell takes us through all these simple little things that we need to do. However, you go outside, you turn the key, and click. Now what? So now we're gonna walk you through the starting portion uh, of this, and we're gonna take you through. So we got a battery that we pulled out of a unit, uh, just to kind of talk to you. Tim, if you'd go ahead and flip up that seat. Absolutely. And uh, this just gives you a little bit better direct view of what we're dealing with here uh, on a local level. So what's going on? You turned your key, click, 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 click. There's a couple things that could be. Number one, start with your battery. Now, most people don't have what they call a load checker. 
Uh, that's at AutoZone or any one of uh, uh, the automotive type places. You can go up there, they'll be glad to help you out. But what they do is they take a load checker and it simply looks, looks like a toaster. They hook two leads on there and they load check the battery and it's either good or it's bad. And they'll tell you. Now, always wanna charge it before you take it in and have that looked at. But in this case, you click. So the very first thing you do is check your terminals. So you'll pull your plus, you'll pull your minus, you're gonna be looking directly at them and you're gonna look for corrosion. It happens, there's nothing you can do about it. Also, if you leave it in a barn or in the backyard and you got fertilizer, or you got anything in that barn, all of that stuff will help with corrosion. So make sure you take a look and then uh, relieve these units. And what I always do is I take them off and then wipe them down. I even put a little oil on them. Why? And then I sand them back where they're gonna come back because now you don't have to worry about that corrosion uh, from atmospheric yep. pressures or whatever. So it's something to keep in mind. Now, you charged it up. You take it up, it's load checked. Get on the tractor, click, click, click. Well, there aren't very many things to check from there. <laughs> so the battery goes to your key. The key says, hey, you know what? I'm ready to go. That's great. Turn the key and you gotta click. But you know your battery's good. So now you gotta start looking for other things. What is it that's going on? In between the two items of your starter and your battery is what's called a solenoid. That solenoid sits up under inside of here, right below your battery box on the backside on some units. Some units it's up front, just depends on the tractor, but in general, they're on the backside. That is allowing large power to be closed. That's as simple as that. So when you turn that key, it closes that power and it fires. Well. It needs two things. It needs is plus and it needs minus. So if you have corrosion on your negative cable and it can't get negative down to the solenoid, can't close the solenoid properly, okay? If you have corrosion on your positive and it can't get to the solenoid, it closes that as well. Hey, we got a question that came in. Is it bad to keep oil in your engine over the winter or do I have to drain it, in, uh, drain it every year? Um, there's nothing wrong with keeping oil. What I do recommend to people, change it before the winter. And here's why, it's done. So now you came outside and you got 12 inches of grass and you got, we all know how this goes. And you go outside and now you go to run the machine. Well, you don't have to worry about the oil. You don't have to worry about any of this. That is always the best time of year to do your maintenance is before the winter starts. But you gotta still pay attention to what we're yep. talking about here with batteries and so forth. So I wanna get back to over here. So we answered the oil and there's a slight delay out there. That's why we're answering questions yep. from the last segment. But batteries, so now you got the click and you're wondering what's going on. There are generally two wires that come in at your positive terminal and the, there's a thick one and a thin one. That thin one is what goes down to that solenoid and activates. So it goes to the, start, or to the ignition switch and it tells the solenoid to go ahead and fire. If you had corrosion there and you clean it up, you turn it over and all of a sudden it's fine. Well, that's what was wrong. So it makes it easy. But let's just say that it doesn't. You gotta check your ground to the solenoid. Now, we now run a wire directly to that solenoid, a ground wire, because we're not gonna rely solely on the frame, but it still may have a bad ground. Again, check your ground on this side. If it fires, now you know what the problem was. However, the last click, it goes through all that and your starter can't rotate. You got a spider nest, ant nest, Bee's nest, I don't know, every nest there is goes and <laughs> happens in this machine, trust me. And especially in the springtime, yeah. they love to make their, their nest. And of course, squirrels, uh, badgers, I'm kidding. Uh, but anything that would be up into the engine, we gotta pay attention. So what you'll hear in general is click, because it cannot fire, it's stuck, right? And then you may hear a <laughs> type sound, right? Well, that's your starter pinion not engaging. So now you need to take a look and make sure that the starter pinion's uh, engaging or disengaging. So you fired all the way through and now you're at the starter, that's where we're at. Now occasionally what happens is what's called a hydro lock at the engine and it's because it sits, it develops a hydro lock on, on its compression stroke. It's usually from a weak battery that can't turn it over yep. between the four strokes that we talked about earlier, intake, compression, power, and exhaust, right? So it can't quite get through there. So you go ahead and you lubricate that starter. Now I wanna warn everybody, when I say lubricate that starter, be careful. If you over lubricate that starter, you'll never get it started because it works on friction. So you need to understand how that works with centrifugal force and friction. Uh, but at the end of the day, that may be your starter pinion that you hear on there. But that is a nice progression to walk from the battery. Uh, in this case, they're lead acid. So let's segue to that. I think it's a good question about AGM. Yeah, absolutely. Let's talk about that. Sure. No, uh, AGM, so uh, it's, gonna, it's gonna be a, a glass mat style battery. Uh, it's, 
we are going to see come uh, from us at some point. Uh, those are actually out there in the market today. You can purchase them um, through a couple of different local retailers. So uh, these, ba these batteries here are actually lead acid. So inside of this battery, you have lead plates that go down through there. Uh, there's an electrolyte that's in there, usually referred to people call it as battery acid. Uh, so that electrolyte actually goes inside and reacts with those lead plates and to actually um, uh, move voltage. Uh, AGM is actually a newer style of system where it's actually very more, it's a lot more stable. Um, it does hold electricity a lot longer. Um, you get more cold cranking amps from, from those batteries as well, uh, at least for a longer period of time. Um, so uh, that's why you're going to see those actually be a little bit more costly. So your lead acid battery is approximately, you know, $20, $30, the lower range. And you look at the AGM batteries, you're upwards of 80 or 90. Um, that would be the reason, just because of the, of the stability and uh, longevity of those batteries. One thing I want to add on to that, though, that we, we kind of uh, talked about. Uh, so let's say that you looked at your battery and you knew it, it was a good battery and you did not hear the click on your rider. You so go. you turn on the key and you get absolutely nothing. You press the brake, you turn the key. First thing you want to keep in mind is underneath the seat of your rider, um, right next to the battery is a fuse. Something very quick and easy you guys can check. So if you pull this fuse out, um, back out of the holder, uh, this is a standard um, ATM type fuse. If you look at it, um, you can see the connection in between here. So these two terminals should be connected in the middle. Um, so if you know you have a good battery and you get to the point where you still don't have anything that does not does not click, check, take, take a look at your fuse. So AGM battery, lead acid or not, uh, make sure you have a good fully charged battery. Uh, make sure the fuse is good. And then um, at that point, if you get to a point where you don't get anything to start, it's having a, you don't hear the clicks, uh, that was what I would say to recommend taking it to your local Troy Belt dealer um, and have them take a look at it. So I'm going to add a little bit about AGM batteries. Uh, we're moving to them uh, as a company. And the reason we're going there, some of our units already have it. Some of the units are coming with it. Um, it has a slower degradation over time. It can be stored in a facility and not have to worry about it. You may get the click, but you're going to go ahead and be able to charge that back up. What happens with lead acid over time is it diminishes to a point it can't regain and come back to its normal composure. So we're going to go ahead and move into this AGM. Uh, it's going to give the consumer a better satisfaction. And we learned that through the consumers. So that was a really, really big deal uh, as we were going through there. So uh, we have covered every system uh, on this tractor. Uh, we've answered as many possible questions that are coming through on here. Um, the electrical system is a super important thing. A trickle charger is great. Put a trickle charger in your battery over the winter. If you're not going to do that, pull the battery out or charge it first. Pull the battery out, bring it in, put it on something other than the concrete ground. That's all I have to say. So put it on a piece of wood or put it somewhere, uh, let it store for the winter. Always cover your posts your positive negative post because we don't want to have any issues with that and then let it sit and then in the springtime do the exact same thing uh, and and move forward as you go so we got a question that came in and says what height should i be cutting my grass at uh, very good uh, depending on the units uh, riders zero turns whatever they cut at different variances for instance this is one and four inches so you can go anywhere from one inch, which is all the way down to the ground. Oh, and by the way, this is a three-finger easy system. If for some reason it's not moving up and down easily, uh, you need some lubrication and make sure that whatever is rusting up and that happens Absolutely. Um, because of uh, environmental uh, uses. But at any rate, you want to that's one inch, and you're not going to want to go lower. We have people ask all the time, I want to go lower. For what? To do the roots? But I'm talking about tree roots. But at the end of the day, you will damage your machine, so the lower you go. So we did through research, we found out one to four inches is where people want to go. Yes, we all want to cut 27 inches of grass, I know. I hear about it all the time, but the reality is that's not how it works. What we ask is, uh, especially when you're mulching, cut off one inch yep. at a time. Now you're going to say, one inch at a time, that's ridiculous. I don't have time for that. We know. You let it grow. I know. I, the other day, I was going through grass I shouldn't have been going through, but killing the engine, right? So at the end of the day, it is really imperative you, you cross cut, 
So you should try to always go perpendicular. So this time, go this way, back and forth. Next time, go perpendicular. And if you can, go at the angle. Why? It's good for the grass. It helps a lot of things. And uh, as you heard earlier, the grass and the mulch are good for your, your lawn. You're putting your nutrition back into the lawn. You just want to make sure it's shredded up properly. Now, we all know when things are ugly and it's dropping the big shavings on the ground, or in this case, sometimes puts the really thick matted grass down, you got to get that up. But go back out there in a week or so, recut that grass, and you'll be good to go. So that makes it uh, simple that way. Absolutely. Uh, any other things that you can think of? Uh, honestly, I, I don't think so. I think we've spent a lot of time. We've covered a lot of things. Absolutely. Uh, definitely open up for questions. So if people have questions out there in the audience. Send them in. Send them in and we'll be happy to answer them here. We've got a few minutes left. So uh, sh question, should I cut at different heights for different seasons? Uh, yes. And um, that's all going to depend on what type of grass you have. So different grass types, uh, there's a whole list of them. It'd be better to look them up up on the internet because I can't regurgitate all of them. Um, but there's, there's different heights. Uh, there's also uh, different times to cut grass. So sometimes it's better to cut early in the morning, late afternoon. Miss that midday mow. Mowing at noon is, is, not, the, is not the optimal time to mow. Now, are you going to hurt your grass? Probably not if you don't do it for an extended period of time. But those early morning and the, the late afternoon mowings is where you, when you, really when you want to go out and mow the yard. Um, so um, another question just came in. My mower is missing parts of my grass and make me, making me go over everything twice. Uh, very good question. And Jack and I kind of covered all that as we went through here. So blades, that's going to be your first one. Uh, another question that I would ask you if you called into the service center, are you running your mower at full throttle? All of, these, all of these units are designed to run at wide open because not only does the engine run more efficient, uh, runs cooler. People don't think that way, but with that engine, the, you know, the flat, the fan on top of the engine spinning at three, you know, 3,000 whatever RPM, it's actually cooling the engine better. You're moving more oil. Um, so full throttle is another big thing. The third thing we, which we talked about, is to make sure that your deck is cleaned out from underneath of it. All that large buildup of grass, especially now in the springtime, is going to uh, prevent air from flowing. It's going to prevent grass from circulating the way it's supposed to. Um, so what, you're gonna, what you get is actually windrows. Uh, one other thing to think about, which we did not talk about, is going to be how fast are you mowing your grass? Mm -hmm. And how tall of grass are you mowing? If you're in six or seven inches of grass and go, mowing as fast as a lawnmower will go, what's happening is, is underneath the deck, it's trying to stand the grass up to cut it. And that's not happening. It's actually just pushing the grass back down. So an hour later, when the sun makes the grass stick back up, you see those uh, uncut parts of grass. So those would be my, my, my suggestions. Yeah, I want to add to that. Um, a full throttle is a huge, huge thing. We've heard it forever. We're tired of hearing it. And why? Because you're actually hurting your machine. And as much as you think that you're saving your machine, it's kind of like um, when you're on the highway and somebody's going 40 and you're trying to go 65, 70. Yeah, it's really impeding the progress, right? And I don't mean to use that analogy, but it's the exact same thing. A second thing that Tim alluded to earlier, the transmission requires, especially on a hydrostatic, it needs to be cooled. There's a fan on there that is blowing air across the top of that transmission. And again, if you want to maintain that, you can. You can pull the battery out of there and see directly drawn on the drive system them, and I go back to this nozzle I keep pulling it up because a lot of people don't realize it's worth the money believe me uh, high, this is a really pointed pressure so you're able to get in there and blow everything off the top of the deck the spindles including your drive system so you can pull that battery out of there have direct access spray everything down below and now you have direct access to the transmission itself so it's just something to think about uh, what benefit of a large wheel uh, of large rear wheels on a walk behind? I'd love to talk about this because this is one of my things. So just like a chipper shredder vac or anything else, if you want an easy pivot, and you're going to see it right now, by going to big rear wheels, it's like a dolly. So if anybody's ever used a dolly, you got a nice uh, application here. So the dolly goes up underneath the object. You simply lift it rearward and you make your pivot. Okay. Now, depending if it's a rear wheel drive, front wheel drive, or whatever it might be, that's something else that you have to take into the equation as far as operation goes. But these large re rear wheels make it very, very easy for you to make the pivot and head back down the row uh, in the opposite awesome. direction. So I did see a question come up right in after that. It says, how often do I need to clean under my deck? I think we talked about this a little earlier. 
uh, realistically, I would say suggest that you look underneath of it every time you mow, uh, especially with the deck wash system. So the deck wash system is designed to help assist you in keeping the mower deck clean after each mowing. Um, if you let the, the, the grass and stuff build up too long, uh, you're, you're going to have to scrape it anyway. The deck wash is not going to clean all that thick grass out from underneath of it. So I would say before, after you mow each time, just look underneath your mower deck and inspect it to make sure you don't have that uh, grass build up, especially in, in your wet mowing seasons for wherever you're located. For us in Ohio, you're looking at, at April to May and then in September and October when, it, when the grass becomes a little bit more damp. So I want to do a real quick recap now that we've gone through and enjoyed an hour and a half together. Absolutely. Two hours uh, at, yeah. uh, with our influencer. But at the end of the day, we want to talk about what's bulleted. Uh, number one, you're all coming out, you're all pulling this thing over and it won't start. I want you to ask one question. When did this happen? That's what you got to ask yourself. I know you all want to go, it's the <laughs> manufacturer. We get it. But at the end of the day, ask yourself, when did this happen? Because you can answer 99% of the time when it happened. So let's say you took the blade off, you put the blade on, and it's making a, a clanging sound, right? Well, it happened when you took the blade off, right? Um, it, it's all of a sudden missing grass. We'll talk about missing grass, right? Well, you sharpen the blade, so no longer are the blade tips coming together on a rider, right? So now you're missing some of your grass. So I know you want to point this way, but at the end of the day, where are you? What's your environment? You got sand? Well, sand is like being in a sandbox. Take your machine, throw it in a sandbox, you got a sandblaster, right? Sandblasting everything up underneath the machine. So at the end of the day, these are little things that are so, so important that it's not even funny. So ask yourself, when did this happen? And I can tell you over the years, you will find out, oh yeah, I hit an ant hill. I didn't want to tell you that. Yeah, why? Because you take the blade off and the next thing you know, the blade's like this. <laughs> By the way, a dealer, when they sharpen your blade, uh, they have other units uh, that go with that blade. So they check to make sure it's true, not only balanced side to side, yeah. but they also put it on a unit that uh, has a magnet and they check to make sure that that blade is true. So if you're getting a little area, especially on a rider that is missing, um, that's uh, in general, there's something that got hit, it bent a blade, and what you'll find is you'll get that little center uh, windrowing coming up. Or if your blades are a little short, you will leave grass on the outside of the unit in dispersion, right? And that's because it's no longer handling the tip-to-tip -tip contact. So that is a major importance. Batteries, make sure you charge them up. Uh, trickle chargers are dirt cheap today. Heck, real chargers are dirt cheap today. So uh, pick one up and get yourself moving. Um, as far as starting, and we're gonna end uh, in the, with this in a minute, carb and choke cleaner. I can't tell you enough, do not use starting fluid. And why? Because this is what you wanna use to get your machine up and running. If you can't get it up and running and it's fuel related with this, don't, don't do it. All you're gonna do is damage your machine. And I'm only saying that because I can tell you when we get these phone calls, we totally understand what's going on out there. So what I'd like to say to everybody is thanks again for joining us. If there's anything we didn't get to today, be sure to reach out to Troy Built on our social media channels uh, or check out troybuilt.com for lots of great information. Tune in again on May 1st and May 15th for more great gardening and equipment tips. For now, enjoy your time in the yard. Thank you. Thank you, Jack.